welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. Our guest author is Father Mark Haydu. We're going to talk about two of his works, Meditations on Vatican Art, and a new one, Meditations on Vatican Art, having to do with the angels. Welcome, Father, to EWTN's Bookmark. Thank you so much. Bookmark. Mark, careful be... watchers of EWTN would recognize you possibly for a series we did, you, Liz Lev did with us, in Rome with Mary Shovlin. That's right. And you were featured on that Catholic canvas, right? That's right. It was a fantastic collaboration going through the Vatican collection, highlighting different areas of the faith. Right. And uh, so you work in Rome, right? Yeah, I'm there full time when I'm not traveling and in the studios of EWTN, but I've been there for 12 years in Rome, seven years working at the museums. And what is your job actually at the Vatican Museum? I'm the coordinator of what's a group called the Patrons of the Vatican Arts. So okay. they're mostly Americans, really, that come to the help of the Vatican to preserve mm -hmm. through donations our collection. So we have hundreds of thousands of pieces that need restored. And so our patrons help us finance mm -hmm. the restoration. Well, so in in the one particular book, the Meditation on Vatican Art, which is the first one you had put together like this, right? This mm -hmm. was your first one. That's right. You talk a little bit about how you ended up uh, where you are, and you go back to 1991. You're in Guatemala. You're in a, a, a in the middle of a trash dump <laughs> uh, in the you know in the third world, and you're thinking, I better get begin to question what God was had in store for me, you ended up deciding it was the priesthood, but of all places for you to end up with, here you start off talking about being in this third world, you know, place yeah, where yes. people are basically living, mm -hmm. the bottom of the of the rung, and now you're surrounded by the, the, the greatest beauty that has ever been commissioned and created mm -hmm. by man. H how does that work for you? Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing transformation, so to speak, but I really started out wanting to serve God, wanting to do His will, but and I thought at that point it was mm -hmm. serving the poor in Guatemala, discovered my vocation, then joined my religious congregation, Legionaries of Christ, ended up being formed in Rome, and at the end of my formation they needed someone to take over this office in the Vatican, it asked the Legionaries for a priest, and so I was sent, so there you go. So from the trash dumps to, you know, I was often talk to my patrons that now they're the, 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 I was called, the, the natives that I'm <laughs> sent to evangelize right. and work with. Right, who need as much evangelization, in some cases more evangelization than those poor people who might be at that's uh, true, and there's certainly right. not the openness. You know, it's like Christ with the uh, the Pharisees. Those who who need help sometimes don't think they need help, right. and so working with uh, with. With well-to-do people, people in the arts, there's definitely a spiritual thirst and hunger. Right. Well, they, they, there's a level of self-sufficiency for them, right? Yeah, Where they're not used to well. needing other people to be successful or to get what they feel like they want or need. Right? Exactly, but there's also a truth that when you come right. to the ark there, you, you do realize I've right. got everything, but I don't have there's, anything. There's something missing. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Now, you said that uh, you one time heard a voice, and that's what helped you decide that you were supposed to become a priest. Have you ever heard that again? Not as clearly, maybe as in that one occasion, mm -hmm. you know, but I certainly in prayer, God's constantly present and inspiring and directing your priesthood and how to serve. But there I was asking, you know, I was lost in this mm -hmm. trash dump there when I was 19 years old looking to find my group again. And I was really challenged with the question, you know, if I called you to serve these people, would you stay here? Right. And that set me on a chain of, of prayer and mm -hmm. reflection that led me to my vocation. But God certainly mm -hmm. speaks through angels, through beauty, through inspirations every day. So when our heart is open to hearing His voice, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that it's an active conversation. Now, you say in this, meditations on Vatican art will enable you to experience masterpieces from the Vatican while meditating upon them. For most of these sacred art pieces were created for the faithful to pray with more fluidity. Now, it's interesting in this too, because the way you set it up, you know, you would think, oh, gee, here's this beautiful coffee table book with all these beautiful images from the Vatican Museum. Isn't this great? But you really did try to set it up in, in, in a sense, and you talk about how to use the book where you've got a prayer and reflection, like in the beginning here on this one that started with the vision of St. Helena, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this beautiful piece of art. And then later you say, Lord Jesus, it's not easy to endure the cross in our day-to-day -day lives. We are often weighed down by tragedy, the humdrum of life, injustices large and small, the multitude of distractions that keep us from 
seeing you clearly. And then you talk about, you know, thinking about St. Helena, thinking about her contemplating the face of God, and then reminding us, what are some of the blessings that God has given you today? How might you use these blessings? Do you think many times we get caught up too much thinking about the cross mm -hmm. in our lives or what we perceive and, and miss the blessings we're given? No, there's no doubt that Good Friday, when it comes our way, <laughs> looms larger than Easter Sunday, and, and we can become very focused on that. But St. Helena, you know, the mother of Constantine who brought the cross and other relics back from Jerusalem to Rome, mm -hmm. It was kind of the door through that work of art to meditate on that. We're given many treasures and we're to pass those on to others. And sometimes the treasure itself mm -hmm. is the cross and we need to see through that, et cetera. So really the goal of the book is to help you look at the work mm -hmm. of art and use a certain visio divina to go up a level from what you're looking at into a spiritual reflection that feeds your soul. Well, you also talk about something that's called the way of beauty. What is that? Well, the way of beauty is, is a path towards God that goes through the beautiful through grace, through gift, through life, through inspiration, through things that I see, et cetera, that God speaks to me through mm -hmm. my senses and through my day-to-day -day life. And if I have an eye for beauty, if I'm mm -hmm. looking for that harmony, for that inspiration, that can also be a path towards Him, you know? Mm -hmm. It's uh, a reflection of God. Exactly, exactly. Through And, and it can seem like Catholic light a mm -hmm. little bit, oh, the beauty and the joy right. and let's feel good. No, it's just experiencing God's right. love in all the ways that it comes. It comes through the cross. Well, that's where too. I think the approach of our Holy Father, when he talks about an accompaniment encounter, this is a way to get people involved mm -hmm. and then hopefully out of their own spirit, like reading a book like this, it's not just appreciating, gee, what a great artist this person was, exactly. or isn't that a beautiful uh, painting or a fresco or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, it's really getting behind it in your own spiritual life, understanding the spirituality maybe of what drove the painter what, exactly. what was this trying to convey? It wasn't just done in such a way because it looked beautiful. There's a message, basically, in all of this art, right? Yeah, exactly, and that's what I was, what people come to Rome oftentimes to do is see and experience the beautiful, but there's a chance that it just had been there, done that, wow, that was great, and on with life. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to say through this, whoa, don't, it's not just to been there, done that. It, there's, there's power behind that And you can take this beauty. with you. And you can take this with you, and it should touch your And don't your leave heart. it on your coffee table, don't right? dust it off. Maybe Read it should it. be uh, next to, on your bed table, And uh, beauty is a great way you know? to reach those people that maybe aren't right. in the pews in a regular way, you know? Now, how did you decide when you laid this out, besides, you know, the purpose of the book and the way you had the reflections and the questions, you also based this on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Okay, now our present Holy Father is a Jesuit, Father mm -hmm. Mitch is a Jesuit. These, it seems like uh, the spiritual exercises have almost gotten popular again. Is that true? I think so. There's definitely, it definitely meets a need. I, as a seminarian, every year do spiritual exercises. And so, in fact, when I was approached by Liguri Press to do this book, they had three ideas, and I said, mm -hmm. I couldn't do any of them. And they said, what can you do? And I said, it have to be something that I already have experience with, which was the spiritual exercises. They are very popular because they, they bring you to slow down, mm -hmm to pray, to reflect, and there's a process to it as the book follows. You know, there's a reflection on God, His goodness, His love, mm -hmm. sin entering the world, God's response to sin in Jesus Christ, the salvation that comes through the sacrament. So it, it builds mm -hmm. one upon the other. So progressively going through the book, you're actually going deeper in being led mm -hmm. in your spiritual life. And I think that's very powerful so for So your journey today. in a sense to the book. Your journey, and people need right. to be accompanied to grow. Right, you say here, beauty makes the truth more palatable as honey might help us take our medicine properly. So have you found that in your experience that in dealing with maybe some people who had a great affinity for the arts, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe not an affinity for their faith, that by becoming more involved with the one, it mm -hmm. led them to a deeper understanding of the other? There's no doubt artists and people who are appealed to, you know, attracted to beauty, go into the Sistine Chapel. They might not agree with the church on a lot of mm -hmm. issues, but when you go into the, they're not arguing with the church. They're, mouth is open, they're like, wow, explain this to me. Beauty opens the soul. It, it lets the truth come in more smoothly. It, even uh, Pope Benedict, uh, Pope Emeritus mm -hmm. Benedict said right. that on many occasions is if you try to present an argument, you know, mm -hmm. someone says, I disagree here, and you say, well, you answer with another truth. Mm -hmm. That back and forth tennis match mm -hmm. leads to conflict necessarily as you're trying to discover the truth. Beauty is a different way. People are open and they want to respond. They're not, it's not as conflictive. It's, it's more it's not as communal, maybe too, not right. as threatening. Right. And so he often says architecture, church art, right. beautiful church art, beautiful music, beautiful right. art lifts up the soul and creates communion. And, and that's really where it's, a, I think, an advantage 
for showing the power of our faith and responding to people's desires. Well, you, well, you say in this book, and then ultimately it's, it's very basically laid out the second way in the angel's book, very similar. It's basically mm -hmm. the same kind of format. Each reflection is intended to lead you into prayer and meditation. Begin by placing yourself in the presence of God, asking the Lord to be with you and to speak with you. You talk about the notion of sacred art and contemplation is often lost on us in the digital age, mm -hmm. where images constantly bombard our cultures, and not only images, but sometimes horrific and uh, almost demonic images and that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Debasing is even a better way of thinking about it. Right? No, it does. And, and our senses is really where the truth comes into our soul, where our soul is fed is through our senses. And so if it's being fed, uh, you know, cancerous <laughs> material, mm -hmm. your soul is weak and, and mm -hmm. can't respond. And, and there's not that, there's not that consonance with the truth and so feeding it beauty is almost a healthy diet for mm -hmm. your senses for your soul it lifts you up it opens you know and so oftentimes we are bombarded and we need to put a little filter but not just that that'd be kind of the part is destruens the negative side you do the positive which is mm -hmm. feed your soul and your children put beauty in front of them music I know a family that Saturday they clean up the house putting classical music mm -hmm. on and the kids are working and they love it right <laughs> It, it feeds their soul. Now, some might be thinking, oh, my children would never go for classical music. But beauty mm -hmm. needs to be put out there, and it's a great form of education. I, it was interesting, too, in looking through this book, and you mentioned it here, at times fixing on one element, talking about the painting or the, or the picture or the sculpture, you in the whole piece, can anchor you on the whole piece, allowing you to then to assimilate the whole work little by little, starting off with one piece. And I'm trying to remember whether it was in this particular one, and I think it was in the garden, mm -hmm. maybe, and how you point out see the apostles in the corner over there? Right. You know what I mean? And, and you almost don't even notice them. I mean, when you're watching our Lord's passion, exactly. you know, and you say to your, and then suddenly you say, oh, right, they are over there. They, they are in the corner there. And you ask the question, well, well, how would you have reacted? You know, what would it have been like for you exactly. if you were one of the apostles when our Lord had asked you to, uh, can't you stay one hour with me? And Bishop Sheen has made that famous over the years exactly. with talking about Eucharistic adoration. But that struck me when you said that whole idea of just starting with one little piece mm -hmm. and then moving And analyzing there, right? a work of art or anything, you really do want to start from a point where you fix and then you understand and you start to go from there. And that can challenge actually Ignatius, one of his, mm -hmm. uh, his elements of his meditation is to put yourself into the scene, whether it's a scripture mm -hmm. passage, you know, hear the sounds, see, uh, smell the smells, get into the scene where Jesus, where is he sitting? Where are you sitting? What do you see? What do you, right. to get the senses involved and not to part from sacred scripture, but to get yourself right. into it. And the same can, can go through the work of art. And then you make the reflection, well, where am I in the scene? Right. Jesus is over there suffering. Am I suffering with him or am I asleep in the corner? Right, or on my head and out of the garden <laughs> as fast as I could get. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is what I was, I wasn't counting on this. Uh, <laughs> you have vision of St. Francis. The theme was God created us for mission. You say, God, you have created us for a special and to live in eternal happiness. But then you go to point out, I thought this was good. Is God calling you today for a special mission or purpose? Keep in mind that no job is too small on the side of that. I think sometimes for some of the faithful out there, people, mm -hmm. wonderful people, they don't appreciate what they're doing in their prayer life, what they're doing in their everyday mm -hmm. life in caring for their family and taking care of their elderly parents, right. looking after a sick friend, raising their children in a tough environment, holding a marriage together. Mm -hmm. Those are all missions that are they're certainly more important than many of the missions that people see on TV right. or in the headlines, right? No doubt, no doubt. The little things of life can be extraordinary and great. Uh, you know, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus often talks about doing mm -hmm. ordinary things with extraordinary love. That's the measure. You know, God judges things so much different than, than we do. And those little things of life, just your duties of your state in life, caring, loving, pardoning, working, etc. All those things, it's not the material thing that defines its greatness. Mm -hmm. It's not the immediacy or it's the heart and the love within. Mm -hmm. And how many saints are unknown to the world. And how many people watching us today are saints and don't know it? Most saints didn't think they were saints. <laughs> right, right, exactly. The church declared it afterwards. And, and sanctity is that. It's the day-to-day -day live with love. I always think you, you go to heaven sometime, you'll see some famous saints sitting midway back, and there'll be a <laughs> bunch of people you never knew. You right. know who they are already are sitting there right up close to the Lord. Or so, you might look uh, back and see some saints that you had a devotion to. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I always tell my son, when you, when, when you reach heaven, look way in the back and wave. I might be there.
there. <laughs> uh, meditation on the art. You also moved into Angels. Now, Angels are kind of popular these days. It was a very popular television series. It's popular in reruns. Mm -hmm. uh, was there a reason you picked Angels? Was it because you felt it was, is, it was something that could connect to the general public? I did, and I also saw there was a real fascination with the spiritual world. I mean, after the, the success of the Twilight series and mm -hmm. all these sitcoms oh, or TVs okay. on, yeah. on the kind of the more darker evil mm -hmm. inside, you know, Sleepy Hollows and all this, there's a fascination with the spiritual world. And, you know, I was thinking about what would be my next book, walking to my office there in the Vatican. I walked underneath uh, a famous painting of Jacopo, and it's the casting out of the, the demons from heaven, mm -hmm. you know, from Revelations. Right. And, you know, what I thought, no is that one the one knows, that's in here? I know there is exactly. one. Exactly. Yes, okay. No one knows angels and demons better than the Catholic Church. We've been mm -hmm. dealing it since the Garden of, Gethse right. of Eden, right. to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the present day. And so I thought, we need to bring what the Church teaches us. It's mm -hmm. an element of our faith, the catechism. It's an article of our faith that angels exist mm -hmm. and that they're there to protect and, and certainly our present us. Holy Father talks about them all the time, basically, exactly. and the reality of the devil. Exactly. Now you say here, it is true that artists over the centuries have presented angels in their purity and delicate sweetness more often than not, yet scripture tells another story. What's the other story? The other story is that angels are powerful beings. Mm -hmm. They're there to defend, to fight, to advance the ball. They're not, you know, squishy, tender little kids that are there to decorate in the corner. They're <laughs> little leaders. Little creatures. They're, they're warriors. They're powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's not to be conflicted as much as I have an angel with me whose only commission from God is to get me to heaven. And I need, I need to rely on that, that power and that intercessory and defense that, mm -hmm. that's there. And so that's what I wanted to kind of open up our eyes to the spiritual uh, kind of advantage we have in the angels that accompany us. You say angels are not just mythical creatures of ancient history. They are real presence in our lives today. All we have to do is pray for assistance. And it's interesting too, because you kind of talk about, you, you start in the Old Testament and go mm -hmm. into the New Testament and kind of show that in some ways the messenger, quote unquote, uh, maybe had a little different role in the Old Testament than they seem to have in the New Testament. How is it different? Yeah, it's certainly the, our belief in the, the theology of angels has developed. You know, even in the Old Testament, they're kind of warriors. They're close to the throne of God. They even come to exterminate, in some cases in the Old Testament, defend God's mm -hmm. right. They're like servants in the court of the king. In the New Testament, the focus is a little more there. The king has arrived, Jesus Christ, and he refers to the angels often, you know? An angel announces his birth. An angel mm -hmm. comes to Joseph to save him from, from Herod. Uh, he tells his disciples, no, their angels are before the throne of God, you know, these little ones. An angel consoles him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're much more there to console, to accompany Christ, to show God's love and compassion. Uh, and then St. Peter himself mm -hmm. is, is freed by an angel from, from jail. And in fact, in, in the Acts of the Apostle, when he knocks on the door of the family after being, the, the woman is so surprised, she tells everyone, Peter's out there. And the response of the early Christian, no, it must be his angel. Mm -hmm. it's, and they believed in angels. They, they were present in the lives of the church. Right, exactly, they were real. Now, thinking about this, looking at the angel book, it, that struck me, because you mentioned the, the cherubs, and I thought it was interesting that in some paintings you have the angels who seem to be older, mm -hmm. kind of, like you said, maybe more powerful. Other ones where they're old cherubs, mm -hmm. and sometimes where they seem to be a mix of them. And one of the ones that struck me in the one called the Deposition, mm -hmm. okay, which is basically taking our Lord down from the cross, uh, they're cherubs in the background. And it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting in a sense. Here's this kind of, you know, this stark yeah, reality, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of cherubs who are kind of just, they look like they're just kind of hanging out. <laughs> exactly. why, why, did the, why do you think the artist made that choice? Well, I think Sebastiano Conca in that, that painting there, there is a contrast between the suffering of Jesus mm -hmm. who's laying in Mary's arms and she's, she's sorrowfully accepting with her hands, and the angels in heaven always represent a bit of the supernatural mm -hmm. vision of the same human event. The, the purity of Jesus, the victory of Jesus, that this is just a passing moment that heaven awaits. They're, they're kind of a reminder mm -hmm. of the simplicity, the beauty, the purity, the eternal mm -hmm. in the midst of our human drama. So the contrast is meant, mm -hmm. I think, by the author.
Mm -hmm. Also, uh, on day 20, an angel frees the souls in purgatory. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing here. A lot of people have a lot of interest in the holy souls in purgatory, of course, mm -hmm. wanting to pray for them. And, and as a Catholic, coming to understand in a world that doesn't believe basically in hell, maybe they think heaven, but they <laughs> right. certainly don't, there's no hell, so they're not sure why there should be a purgatory or what purgatory is. It is interesting here because here it looks like the holy souls in purgatory do look like they're uh, suffering maybe a little more than people tend to talk about it today. Have you seen in looking at how the angels were represented in art as you move through time that you can tell in a sense the cultural ideas being mm -hmm. reflected in how the stories are told in the artwork of its time? Yeah, there's no doubt that, that the art reflects the cultural milieu and the cultural beliefs. And so there you have in the 1600s with Karachi's painting you have a real belief in the suffering. Mm. Many paintings of the, of the Last Judgment show the people in hell, the sins that brought them there. They're very graphic, they're very they're suffering. And then if you go to, for mm. example, Salvador Dali's angelic landscape, mm. it, it's just ethereal, peaceful, it, just the, the afterlife there with angels prancing around this idyllic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so certainly that, re that, that represents a certain popular belief of, of angels and mm -hmm. the afterlife in the 60s, as opposed to in the 1600s, right, where the right. focus was much more on the, the earthly and, mm -hmm. and the purgatory and In suffering. section four, angels all around us, a virgin and angels imploring Christ not to punish lust, avarice, and pride. Now, that was, is that the painter's own personal concerns? Or, <laughs> or well, I mean, here, well, that's, that's such a different, you have any idea what, 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 what? That was a bit of a comparison that was common in the Renaissance between kind of the, the Greek and the Roman um, virtues and traditions and mixing them with Christian because the Renaissance was all about rediscovering mm -hmm. the Greek and Roman ideals, but now that we have the gospel, how do those fit together? Mm -hmm. And so it was very common for the spirited artists to place together those three images. But in that case, even we believe that angels intercede for us even mm -hmm. after we die. For example, in purgatory, mm -hmm. St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas affirms that your guardian angel intercedes and consoles you even while you're in purgatory until you get to heaven. And, and so that's, uh, that's a common belief and it is kind of strange now, but that's the nice thing about art. It reminds us of aspects of our faith that maybe have been kind of left aside for a while. Well, sometimes modern man always thinks uh, nothing of the past is really worth anything, that we're just smarter today, and mm -hmm. that's not always the case. Many <laughs> times we've lost great wisdom and truths, as mm -hmm. even they found in the Renaissance and going back and looking at the Greeks mm -hmm. and realizing there, there was a wisdom there. Mm -hmm. When you were picking out the, the, the images you were using for this book, right. and, uh, you limited yourself to what was in the Vatican museums exactly. because you wanted to be focused on that. What What is the your favorite? I mean, and in going through this, did you change which one was your favorite? What's your, if you had to pick one with the angels, is it the Revelation one that you mentioned earlier, which is to, towards the back of the book or? It is, well, I, if the Revelation or the freeing of St. Peter by Raphael is something I very much like. Mm -hmm. And it's because Peter is there slumbering uh, in his chains and this powerful, luminous angel is in the background coming through to save him. And I often think it's a beautiful symbol, and that's why I like it, that angels and God's work and mercy is often active, even while we're weak and slumbering and not aware of it. That God's power isn't limited by our weakness, but in fact, it calls out to his power. And so we can be very consoled to know that that we are not the measure of God's power mm -hmm. and he comes to our aid. And so I like that very much. There's a modern painting at the beginning, mm -hmm. which I'm, is not as uh, attractive to most folk these days, especially, you know, more people who love devotional work right, from the yeah. Renaissance. But even there in our modern 1960s, struggling to represent eternal truths with mm -hmm. modern medium, mm -hmm. I found uh, that particular painting also Pretty impressive. Well, I didn't see any Campbell's soup cans in here. No, that, <laughs> no, that, that, that's true. Uh, and you talk about the fact that if you have picked up this book, and we, we encourage people to do that, where it was given to you as a gift, then the seed has already fallen into the soil. By using this book for a time of daily prayer, you'll be preparing the terrain so that not only will this seed bear fruit, but many other seeds of God's inspiration will fall into your heart each day. And what's great about something like this is there's a spiritual aspect, and there's also an educational aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, one can, uh, can read through this and, and get a greater appreciation of the beauty of the arts and realize how much the church has done 
all through the centuries when we hear these canards that are out there about right. the kind of medieval, you know, church right. uh, denying all learning, et cetera. We have to hear the Galileo story out <laughs> in Finitum when there's right. so many other better stories to be told, right? Exactly. The church has been a patron of the arts and science for, um, for centuries, and so there's a lot to, a lot to be said, and that's the beauty of museums and encourage people to, to go visit mm -hmm. museums. It gives you a, a sense of history, and not just human history, but God's working in mm -hmm. history all throughout, and it's a beautiful story. It's mm -hmm. salvation history. If someone wanted to find out more about uh, what's going on at the Vatican Museums, uh, what would be the best web address or best well, place to go? They can go on to www.vaticanpatrons.org. Let me ask you also, just before we go, as far as, do you have another book in the works? I'm thinking of two right now. I'm not sure which way I'll, okay. I'll go. So. And how long does it take you to from the from when you decide you're going to do it to actually getting it done? Maybe around th five to six months. I'll okay. usually start around in February and hopefully have it done by June. Okay. So we'll okay. see if well, God gives me the time and energy. Well, make sure you <laughs> stop by when you're in the states again. Thank you so Good much. See you in Ohio, boy. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you very much, Father Mark. Hey, do author of two books we've been talking about, Meditations on Vatican Art, also Meditations on Vatican Art, having to do with the angels. Very popular, beautiful books available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.